So uh, my name is Jan Konings. I am with DuPont Industrial Biosciences, and so is my colleague and my friend here, Mike Salzberg. Um, and we're here to talk, to share with you uh, our points of view on how we feed, fuel, and clothe billions of people uh, without destroying the planet. It's the first time as DuPont and for the two of us that we're here at this conference at South by Southwest Eco. And uh, it's pretty exciting. Um, I like the subject. It's very relevant to the kind of work that we do. And we believe that the work relating, some of the work that we do in our experiences to you is relevant to the conference as well. So we, uh, we look forward to this. How do we feed, fuel, and clothe billions of people without destroying the planet? We believe that the critical transition that we must make is a transition from a petroleum-based economy to a bio-based economy. See, a, a lot of the products that we use on a daily basis uh, are petroleum or petrochemically based. And we're used to using those. They, they're very important in our lives. But unfortunately, they're also unsustainable. And so if we continue to feed, feel, and clothe people with those products, eventually we're going to destroy, we're going to use the planet. And instead, if we switch to a bio-based economy, to an economy where we use sustainably sourced material, a more circular economy, we can feed, fuel, and, and, and clothe people sustainably without destroying the planet. And what we're going to do is we're going to share with you some of our experiences doing this, because that's exactly what we do in our work, in our business. We apply biotechnology, bioscience, to make this possible, to affect an outcome that's a bio-based, sustainable, uh, renewable economy. And to some extent, my career, and I think also Mike's career, followed sort of the same trend. I grew up in Belgium, in Antwerp. Uh, I grew up in the shadow, really, of, of big chemical industry. Antwerp is a big deep, sea, uh, deep water port. So I grew up there, um, and I became a chemical engineer. And most of my career, I worked in the petrochemical industry. Uh, and it's about nine years ago, I took on the challenge of commercializing, developing and commercializing truly sustainable fuel technology, uh, cellulosic ethanol, ethanol from biomass. And uh, we're at just at the edge of commercialization now, starting to produce fuel that is truly sustainable with 90% greenhouse gas emissions reduction. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Mike? Thanks, Jan. So my story starts with my birthday, which is July 20th, 1962. So why that matters is that when I turned seven, July 20th, 1969, that's when this guy on the screen here, Neil Armstrong, took his one small step for mankind. So what happened to me was my mom convinced me this was totally all for my birthday. Thought this was the coolest thing ever. I became the kid that like built the lunar module models and did all that kind of stuff. So I just loved science. Became full on nerd from seven, seven years old on. Space and cadet. Space cadet. Space cadet. I've, I've heard that one before. So um, as time went on, I did my education. I went through and I, I, I became really fascinated with the science of materials. And so. Um, in the end, after I got my PhD and all this stuff in material science, I went to this company, DuPont, that back in those days was the company that made 20 of the 21 layers of high-tech materials that went into the spacesuit. So I ended up at DuPont, and I started my career almost 30 years ago, trying to invent really cool, high-tech, high-performance materials. Um, for the last 11 years, what we've been working on, just like Jan was talking about, I've been leading a team that's looking at how can we make really cool, high-performance materials, but make them from renewable resources, rather than from petroleum. And that's really what we want to talk about today is biomaterials and biofuels. So before we get into you know, where we are today and going forward, let's take a look backwards. So if you go backwards in time, you know, 120, 150 years ago, we had a renewable economy, right? So if, if you wanted to go from point A to point B, you could walk. And maybe if you were lucky, you had a horse. Horse is very renewable. You feed it hay, it has energy, it, it pulls you along. Your house was made out of wood. Maybe you burned wood in your stove. If you wanted to paint your house, maybe use linseed oil or a milk-based paint to, to do what you need to do. The materials we use to, in our everyday life and our transportation were all based on renewable resources. And what happened about 120 years ago, as everybody knows, is we figured out how to extract fossil fuels, petroleum, out of the ground. A lot of great things came from that, right? So petroleum's really high energy density. It's so high energy density that when you make a fuel out of it, you can power a car, you can power an airplane, completely changed the, you know, the way of life for people all over the world in terms of our ability to move around and interact, transportation revolution, unbelievable. Another important thing was um, out of the same barrel of oil that you made fuels from, you also got all these amazing chemicals that enabled us to make synthetic plastics, synthetic, synthetic polymers. So you'll hear us talking through this talk about polymers and plastics, you know, stuff like this, or you know, the water bottles that are holding your water, the packages, your food. Um, 
all those amazing materials that have done everything from you know, revolutionize, how, revolutionize how food is packaged to making incredible lightweight toys and cars and everything else all came from that revolution in fossil fuel. So it sounds like a great thing. The issue is, as I think everybody at this conference is well aware, um, we've all come to realize that having an entire economy based on bringing fossilized carbon up out of the ground and putting it out into the environment is not sustainable. And so right now we're in a world where we're facing uh, you know, 7 billion people on our way to 9 billion people not so long from now. Um, we don't want to go backwards, right? We don't want to go back to, to living like the folks in the picture I showed you. On the other hand, we also want to try to do things in a more sustainable way. And so the key to doing that is how can we get the fuels we want? How can we get the materials we need from plant-based feedstocks directly? Because in the end, fossil fuels were plants a long, long time ago, right? Everybody, fossil means they're fossilized remains of plants. That's where they came from. What we need to figure out is how can we use renewable plants that exist today, um, you know, that we can grow in a renewable manner and take those and use them as the feedstocks to make the fuels and materials that we need. Uh, another important thing that's changing right now is um, if you went back 100 years ago, one of the reasons they went to all these synthetic and petro-based chemicals was the science didn't exist to really make high-performance fuels and high-performance materials from plant-based feedstocks. What's been really fun for me in my 30-year career at DuPont is to watch this amazing revolution in biosciences. So today we have tools in our toolbox that we never had before for working on plant-based feedstocks and turn them into the materials and fuels that we need. Yeah? Thanks, Mike. So we, so we have these tools and, and, and we have these options now. Now what is industrial biotechnology, right? So, uh, because that's the business that we're in. We're in this business of industrial biotechnology. And you've heard biotechnology before. You've heard it predominantly as applied to agriculture, like agriculture biotechnology. You've heard about pharmaceutical biotechnology. What is the industrial part? The industrial part means that we make things that are used by other companies to make products. So in other words, we mostly make intermediates. Intermediates that other people can use to make consumer products or other products more sustainably, more energy efficiently, using less water, and so on. And that means that the applications that we work on are very, very, very diverse and touch almost everybody on the planet. And it also means that we very often work at large scale. And in fact, you can see a picture here of our plant, our enzyme plant, I'll tell you in a minute what an enzyme is, our enzyme plant in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, where we make at a very large scale with very large fermenters uh, these, these enzymes. And working at a large scale is important. It's important not only because that's what our customers need, but it's also important because if you really want to have an impact on the environment, it's great to do things on a small scale. It's wonderful to do things on a small scale. But if you really want to move the needle, you've got to be able to tackle these really big applications. So working at scale is important. In terms of the diversity of the applications that we work on, I'm going to give you two examples. And, and you'll see that they're quite different. Uh, I already mentioned that we produce enzymes. Enzymes are protein, just like uh, just like you find lots of protein in, in nature. Protein that's very active, it's like a catalyst. It has a function, it does something very quickly. And it typically, as an enzyme, it really only does it mostly for a limited period of time and then stops doing it. And the first application I want to talk about is laundry. We all do laundry, I hope. I'm sure you do laundry. And so when you do laundry, you use detergent. And the detergents that we use increasingly have large amounts of enzyme in it. You probably weren't aware that you're using quite a bit of sophisticated biotechnology in your, in your laundry machine. Right? Those enzymes, unlike the old detergents, which were all chemical and used things like surfactants and bleaches and all these things, these enzymes essentially sort of eat their way through dirt. They work better. They allow you to do your laundry better. They also allow you to do your laundry with less water, typically with colder water, which reduces a lot of energy consumption and make it more sustainable. And furthermore, then when you flush, once you flush all that water away and it goes to the wastewater treatment plant, these enzymes stop functioning, they fall apart, and they really become food for the bugs that treat the water. So it's a circle. It's a, you know, it's a circular application. We make it from nature, it goes back to nature, and it does a great function. That's one application, an application that you may not be aware of that you use yourself. Sometimes the applications have a much, much bigger impact on how we live our lives and how society works. And one that I want to talk about in that sense is fuels. Uh, if you think about biofuels and you think about fossil fuels, you see a very different supply chain. So fuel business is essentially a supply chain business. We use a lot of fuel 
You don't know because you don't carry it into your house. But we use large quantities of fuel. And this fuel, if you think of fossil fuels, the supply chain is incredibly complex and long. Somebody makes a hole in the desert of Saudi Arabia and takes it to Rastanura, to that big port that they have in the eastern province, through the Strait of Hormuz under the protection of the Fifth Fleet, the Suez Canal through the, Med uh, the Mediterranean, the Strait of Gibraltar, and then to Houston or to up the Delaware River or someplace to a very large refinery. Right? So it's a very long supply chain, very large central facility kind of supply chain, which with biofuel we change to smaller facilities, regionally distributed, feeding off a supply chain that's a lot shorter, that typically buys, supplies its raw material within 30, 40, 50, maybe 60 miles from around the plant. It's a huge difference. And so therefore, unlike the detergent application, this causes a lot of societal and, and industry changes and uh, transformation. The products we make in a bio-based economy are much closer to plant matter just like petrochemical products are much closer to petroleum, and therefore our products are much closer to nature. And therefore they're also much easier to close the loop with for that circular economy. Um, so those are some of the impacts. That's one of the ways, some of the things that, that we do and what industrial biotechnology really means. Now, when we start to apply it, what does that mean? How do we commercialize it? How do we make it happen? And I mentioned already that by doing this, in some instances, we make really very substantial change. And this substantial change upsets the status quo. It's disruptive. Right? And when you disrupt the status quo, then, then you disrupt the entrenched uh, existing incumbent industry. Some of you, I hope all of you, had a chance to listen to Robert Kennedy yesterday morning in, their, in his keynote address. I thought it was phenomenal. It was really great. And he, and he painted a very clear picture there of how the incumbent oil industry is really putting in a bunch of infrastructure that locks us in in the long term into their product and, in, and, and is optimized and really and sometimes almost exclusively optimized for their slate of products. And that is what we need to disrupt. And to disrupt that requires a long-term vision. I spent quite a bit of my time in Washington, D.C. I never thought that a chemical engineer like me would become later in life an advocate, right? But I spend a fair amount there to talk with regulators and with, with legislators and to give them, to share with them that the vision they have uh, in, in things like institutions like the EPA, in legislation like the renewable fuel standard, the vision they embodied in that and the vision that is executed by the administrations or the, the agencies is a feasible vision. It, vision. it can be done. It takes time. It takes resilience. You need to stick with it. Right. But it can be done. And it's important for us that we inform them of that, that this can be done and must be done. Mike? Yeah, and this incumbency challenge also applies to materials. So when you go out and talk to customers and you say, Would you, are you interested in biomaterials? The answer is always yes, right? Of course I am. And what they're really interested in is, can you give me exactly the same you know, polymer that I use to make this iPhone, exactly the same thing, so I can drop it into my exec existing system, but just have it made out of you know, plant-based resources rather than petroleum? That'd be really easy for me the customer. And obviously that would be, it makes a lot of sense, right? This so-called drop-in idea, if you can make exactly the same chemical to make exactly the same plastic to go into exactly the same application, it takes out all the risk of commercializing these new biomaterials. And that's what customers would really like. The problem is, as I mentioned earlier, plant-based feedstocks are really different chemically from fossil-based feedstocks. So what we recognized quite a while ago is that we have to completely rethink this problem. If you sit there and say, woe is me, how can I possibly make this same polymer that is really well made by a large incumbent petroleum-based value chain from petroleum, how can I do that with plant-based feedstocks? What ends up happening is any system you can, you can come up with costs too much. And what we're about here is not making little niche products for rich people. What we're trying to do is make products that are affordable for everybody. That's how you can make a significant impact. And frankly, that's how we can make a big enough business that it matters to us, honestly. So, um, when we rethought this problem, what we came up with is go out to the customers, understand what people really need, come up with new materials, not ex the same materials, but new materials that are based on, uh, that have high performance, don't make compromises, don't make you go back to living in a barn with a horse, same high performance, but are best made, from a scientific perspective, best made from plant-based feedstocks. So there's one great example is we have a current product in DuPont that's been out for more than 10 years called Serona. Um, 
What you see here is one of our workers at the Kinston plant in North Carolina holding pellets of polymer. And again, as Jan said, remember, what we do is we make a material like a plastic like this. We sell it to people that spit it into fibers or mold it into a part that goes into a, becomes a component in a consumer product. That's what we do. We're materials people. We're back in the value chain. So what you see here are pellets of a polymer called Serona that's made up of two components. One of those components um, is really best made by a fermentation-based process from corn sugar. We make it in the same way you might brew beer. We make that monomer, we, we combine it with another petro-based monomer, and we can make this polymer. So th this polymer is about 40% renewable-based. It has fabulous properties. So Serona, we sell it to people. Primarily, it's spun into fibers. It gets used in carpets. I think we got a picture. This is the Shanghai Airport Lounge. That carpet is um, made from DuPont Serona. If you go into Home Depot and you see Mohawk Smart Strand Carpet, Smart strain carpet is made with DuPont Serona. It's, it started from nothing 10 years ago to have about a 20 to 25% share of the carpet market in the US. Not because it's renewable, people like that it's renewable, but because it's high performance and it just so happens that it, the best way to make that particular polymer is to make it from renewable resources. That's how we're gonna get here, right? Not by beating our heads against the wall and, and saying let's keep make, let's try to make, you know, beat the petro guys at their own game. What we have to do instead is rethink the problem, right? Come back, make, new high performance materials and find where they're valuable. So, you know, Serona is a great example. Um, I guess the other thing that's happening is over the last 20 or 30 years, there's been an agricultural revolution. Um, the amount of corn that we can grow, the amount of uh, feedstocks that are available to us, the cost of those feedstocks has come down. And also, as I mentioned, the tools of modern biotechnology, they all, they all enable us to do these things we couldn't have done. So when I started, you know, a long time ago, what was really cool back then was material science to make little microchips, right? That was the cool thing. What's really cool now is the modern biotechnology that lets us make materials from uh, plant-based resources. So as we look forward to the future, you know, Soren is a great example. It's a $300 million business for us. Started 10 years ago, it's doing great. We look to the future, we have to use the same principle. How can we make new materials that are number one, high performance, number two, cost competitive, and number three, best made from renewable resources? So an example that we're about to bring out to the market is a new process that's called enzymatic polymerization. Um, we have a little video to show you sort of how that works, and when that's over, I'll talk a little bit more about it. Historically, chemists depended on fossil fuels to make products to improve our lives. They strung together petroleum-based molecules to make synthetic polymers like polyester or Kevlar. Plants, on the other hand, use enzymes to string together long chains of sugars called polysaccharides that have a wide range of useful properties. The cellulose in wood, for example, gives it the strength to stand for hundreds of years. DuPont scientists have learned how to copy plants' natural process of making these polysaccharides. We will soon be able to create many everyday household items, like toys, electronics, and packaging from plant-based sugars instead of petroleum molecules, all by harnessing the power of nature. Even better, we can use enzyme technology to change the properties of these polymers, giving us the ability to create a variety of high-performance products accessible to everyone without compromise. The discovery of this enzymatic polymerization process means using very little energy in production, creating almost no waste, and lowering greenhouse gas emissions. A scientific solution for a sustainable future. So what enzymatic poly polymerization basically does is today when you make a polymer, you do it in a chemical facility, typically at high pressure, high temperature, react a couple components together, you make a plastic like, th like this. What plants do, if you think about it, think about a tree. A tree is made up of cellulose, incredibly durable, strong cellulose that makes that tree you know, stand for 100 years. And the way that, and nature's working at room temperature, room pressure, doesn't have the advantages of a big chemical plant, right? The way nature does that is with these enzymes that we talked about before. Nature takes sugars and strings them together in a particular way using those enzymes to make polymers. Then those polymers have great properties. And so for example, you can take the same sugar and if you string it together in one particular way, you make cellulose, which you can't dissolve in water and it'll stand up for a thousand years in a redwood tree. If you take those same sugars and you string them together in just a slightly different way, you make cornstarch that dissolves in water and you can make gravy out of it, okay? So the point is, the way that that polymerization process happens, the way that nature takes those sugars and puts them together in exactly the right way, they use enzymes. It, does, it happens at room temperature, it happens at room pressure, and it uses very, very little energy. What we've been able to do at DuPont is isolate those enzymes and 
um, use them in a very similar process where we could take sugar, regular old sugar from cane, you know, sugar cane or sugar beets, and at room temperature and room pressure directly react that sugar to make the polymer that we want. And we can make a variety of different polymers. And so the next big thing that I see in biomaterials is this kind of enzymatic polymerization to directly make materials in, in this it's a very environmentally friendly way. We can tailor the properties to be what we need them to be, and these end up making very high performance materials. We're working with customers that are making fibers out of them for, for fabrics. Like, you know, this shirt here is a Serona shirt. I'm hoping in two years I'll be wearing a shirt that's made out of a polysaccharide material. Polysaccharide just means many sugars, sugars strung together. Um, we, we're looking at it for fibers. We're making high performance rubber composites for tires. We're making you know, all kinds of interesting applications based on these materials that we make using enzymatic polymerization. So um, it sounds kind of wacky and can you really do this? But we're doing it today at scale. We're developing it with customers and I would hope within two, maybe three years that'll be a, a commercial product and the next wave of great things. So there's lots of really exciting things happening in biomaterials. And it's not just a DuPont. There's lots of other companies out there that have built commercial plants that are out there today selling materials. There's a company called NatureWorks here in the US that makes a polymer called PLA that's biodegradable. It's used for making all kinds of like, silverware and packaging applications. There's a company in Canada called BioAmber who has a commercial scale plant running making biosicinic acid. So this is happening today. The biomaterials revolution isn't something that we're dreaming about. It's something that's happening right now. Jan? So the point here is that disrupting the existing supply chains, disrupting the incumbent industry is tough and hard, but at the same time, it's not just that we're gonna mimic them, we're really gonna create new opportunities. New opportunities and new attributes, new, 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 uh, new, new properties that, uh, that the incumbent industry doesn't talk about. Not just be only because we do it better, in some cases we do, but in some cases we do things they can't even do at all. Uh, my biofuel job takes me to a lot of places in the world looking for opportunities to build out really sustainable biofuel industries. And, um, and the impact that's possible, you can see right away. Not too long ago, for instance, I was in southern Macedonia in the Balkan. Very poor area. You drive through these areas that uh, have farmland that's not used anymore. It's, it's, it's pretty low yielding farmland. And you see villages that are halfway deserted. You see old people, you see kids. Everybody else has left to go find a job somewhere else. These kind of villages can, can be really revitalized with a biofuel industry so that the farmland that's not, not yielding high enough to make food on can be used to make fuel. In China, some of you have been there, some of you have tasted, you can almost taste the pollution in some of the cities, right? It's, they're very polluted. Some of that pollution comes from them, from farmers burning agricultural residues on the field after the harvest. Why do that? You can pick them up, you can use that biomass, you can turn it into fuel clean burning fuel. So these are things that can impact society very considerably. And it's not just about the future. It's not about would and should and could and may. This is happening now. The picture I'm going to show you is the plant that we built in Nevada, Iowa, in the middle of Iowa, in the cornfields. And what it is, is, and you can see it's a large facility. It's a plant that is now in startup phase. And it will make ethanol, cellulosic ethanol, just the same ethanol as you, as you make from any other source, but it makes it from corn stover. Corn stover is the hay, if you want, the leftover of what's left after the corn grain harvest. There's lots of it. As farmers grow corn anyway, this corn stover is there in excess. So we pick some of it up, not all of it, we pick some of it up, and I'll show you the scale of the supply chain in the next chart. We collect this in bales, and there are 700,000 bales that uh, on another computer would show up. Uh, 700,000 bales uh, of, that we collect, these bales weigh about half a ton, so don't think of little bales, these are big bales, lots of them. We would feed a bale like that, a half ton bale per minute into this big plant, and we make 30 million gallons of, uh, of ethanol. Ethanol that has a greenhouse gas impact that is 90% lower than gasoline. And, and to bring home what that really means, I want to show this chart. I'm not sure in this conference you're allowed to use bar charts, but I did anyway, right? I know this is not, not the coolest chart, but it is really the coolest chart. So if you look at this, what I show here is the carbon footprint of you driving a vehicle. The first one is a typical gasoline only E10, right? Temper the gasoline you buy everywhere vehicle. And there you'd have this carbon footprint of whatever this 381 uh, grams of CO2 per mile. 
And plug-in hybrids do better, and battery electrics do a lot better, like less than half. There's still a carbon footprint because electricity contains carbon as well. There's carbon used to make electricity, and this is an average U.S. value. Some areas in the U.S. are better, some are worse. Now, the bottom line I added, everything else on that chart is from the Union of Concerned Scientists. I've got to give them credit. It's really great work, and you can find it online. I added the bottom one. If we use the ethanol that's going to come out of our plant in Iowa, the cellulosic ethanol, and I make flex fuel, and I put it in a flex fuel vehicle that, by the way, is not as nice and snazzy and not as expensive as a nice Tesla, it's just a good old flex fuel vehicle, then I get this carbon footprint that's actually better than the average battery electric. So we can, I'm not saying we should not do electricity or electric vehicles and we should do cellulosic instead. I'm saying we need to do all of these. We need to do both of it. If we want to reach the COP21 goals in Paris on decarbonization of transportation, we got to put this stuff in action. And this is the kind of thing that's possible today and is starting to happen today, and it's transformative. For us, and we'll, we'll be rounding off here, uh, for us, working on these truly transformative, exciting things is exactly that is exciting. It would be easy for Mike and I to go work on clothing, feeding, and, and, and fueling billions of people in a petrochemical way and to continue to destroy the planet in the meantime. But that really doesn't get us juiced. Uh, this is pretty exciting work. Mike? Yeah, thanks, John. So, you know, what we talked about today is some of the challenges that are around with making this huge transformation from a petro-based economy to a bio-based economy. But we've also tried to talk about some of the opportunities, right? The, a lot of the challenges are around the advantages of incumbency. That's what the petro-based economy really has going for it. Uh, but a lot of the um, advantages that we see coming is a lot of the advances in science are really amazing. And I think the societal will and the governmental will that, that Jan talked about and the things like the renewable fuel standard, all that's going to be what's required to make these changes. So um, I can honestly say I've been doing this stuff for about 11 years. I'm more excited about biomaterials today than I was when I started on this project 11 years ago because of the progress that's coming, the commercialization, the traction, and also just the continuous advancements in science. So you know, what we're looking at, as I mentioned earlier, is number one, we're not looking to say um, make false choices. Sometimes you've heard, well, for biomaterials, you can make them and they'll have a good environmental footprint, but they won't be high performance. Or you can get high performance, but they're not going to be cost effective. That's not going to work. They have to be high performance and have a great environmental footprint and be cost competitive. Because again, what we're about is not trying to serve little niche, you know, the test love materials. We're trying to be down in the world of, that has a real impact. And for that to happen, it has to be cost competitive and accessible to most people. That's what we're going to be trying to do. So when I started this talk, um, I talked a lot about Neil Armstrong, and that's what juiced me up when I was a young person, was all the excitement around what could happen with materials technology and what could happen in, uh, you know, with the space program and all that. Today, when Jan and I go out and we try to recruit people to work in our programs, right? we need the, you know, the best young scientists to come and, and work with us in and, and, and other parts of our business, it isn't difficult. I mean, when I, when I go out and talk with young folks, um, this calling, this um, idea that what we ought to be doing with industry, and industrial biosciences is one part of industry, but what we ought to be doing in industry is solving these really big problems and trying to make a move like this from a petroleum-based value chain to a bio-based value chain. It's not hard to get people ex excited about it. It's not hard to convince people to come work in our business, and that's really fun for me. And if I'm really honest, this is some of the most fun I've ever had in my career is what we're doing right now. So hopefully what you've heard from us today is around those challenges and opportunities. We'd love to have a little conversation, answer your questions about anything you might have to say about this. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, I've got the questions here. Can you speak to the energy required to generate the new biomaterials? Is it more, less, or similar to tra traditional fossil materials? Yeah, it's, it's a great question because you know, just because something is renewably based doesn't mean it has a better environmental footprint, right? So if you use the wrong kind of process, you could certainly make um, something that sounds good, that's renewably based, has high performance, but the environmental footprint is no good. For us, um, whenever we, we embark on a new research project, um, it has to have the high performance, it has to have the cost, but it also has to have a significantly better environmental footprint. So for example, the Sirona polymer I showed you replaces a polymer called Nylon 6, doesn't matter. And in that situation, Sirona has 40 to 60 percent better environmental. So, for example, 47 um, percent lower greenhouse gas emissions. 
you know, very, very significant environmental footprint advantages in addition to being cost competitive and having performance advantages. So that's a really important thing. When you start off to do these kind of projects, you've got to have that environmental footprint in mind. Great. Um, hasn't this been a problem since Rudolf Diesel? How, his was biofuel more, how was biofuel more efficient than internal combustion engine, and it was screwed by big oil. How will you see different results? I didn't. didn't. Um, so, so compared to you know Rudolf Diesel and his biofuel and big oil, kind of putting a stop to it. Then, how does Dupont expect to see different results with biofuels with the incumbent industry? Over over time, yeah. Bi biofuels are are a young sector, and um, what what is important in in those large applications is that you're very pragmatic, and that you don't try to wait for the perfect solution, right? So. You, you're, you're trying to bring things that are better. The perfect is, uh, as they always say, the perfect, is the perfect is the biggest enemy of the good. And, and so gradually we make improvements. Uh, some of the first biofuels, arguably you could have said, didn't make the, the environmental impact uh, or the lack thereof that people aspire to. But they're getting better and better. And even existing biofuels, like corn ethanol, is getting better and better. It may not have been as good as everybody wanted, but it's getting better and better. And so stepwise, we, we improve. Okay, unfortunately we're out of time. We'll, we'll be, uh, Mike and I will be sticking around for a little bit. And uh, thanks for your, for your interest and your attention. Thank you.